this, but today is Joshua 23, and we're talking about this whole idea of God purpose. Last weekend, my bride and I were in Omaha at a pastor's retreat, and we met a bunch of other converged pastors, and we met in the Hyatt Place, which is downtown, right in the old market, right in the middle of the old market. Anybody here been to the old market in Omaha on a Saturday or a weekend evening or anything like that? Okay, so some of you have. You can't describe it, really. It is... It's, you know, it's a place full of these it's old buildings that they've restored and made into, made into restaurants and, frankly, bars and pubs and other stores you can shop in, just places you go in and buy all sorts of knickknacks. It's kind of a fun place to go. They had this bookstore that was just full of old books. I mean, it was just incredible. But anyway, we were out in the old market there, right in downtown Hyatt Place, and at 9 o'clock we came back, 9 o'clock in the evening, we came back from getting ice cream with Pastor Donnie and his wife from over at Dannebrog, and the parking lot was completely full, the hotel. Okay, they had a parking garage. There's four four layer four story parking garage there, and and it was completely full, no place for us to park, and so we ended up parking in the street. Well, in the old market, that's kind of the happening place in Omaha, one of the happening places. There's just people everywhere, so we ended up having to park three blocks from our hotel. Now, how comfortable would you be leaving your vehicle three blocks from the hotel on a street in downtown Omaha all night long? Yeah. You're not feeling really good about this whole thing, right? So at 1 o'clock in the morning on Saturday or Sunday morning at 1 o'clock, I'm thinking, I'm going to go move this thing, right? At least get it closer to the hotel. So we get out there, and this place is still packed with people at 1 o'clock in the morning. And there's still cars everywhere. And this was, let me tell you, it was an interesting crowd at 1 o'clock in the morning in downtown Omaha. But as I looked at that, yeah, it started in our hotel elevator. There's a story on that I'm not going to tell you. There's, it started in our hotel elevator, but I looked at those people and I thought, here are some people. They're not homeless. They're not down on their luck. They're driving nice vehicles. They're dressed nicely. They're affluent people who are looking for something. They're looking for something. And they're looking in all the wrong places. Whether they were outside on the sidewalk smoking some sort of weed or whatever it was that they had, whether it was going into the pub and getting just as drunk as they possibly could because we, there was those running around too, whether they looking for relationships, looking to hook up for the night, a lot of that going on too. It was just one of those places of all these people looking for fulfillment. And all week long I've been thinking about this, thinking, you know what, God, whether we want to admit it or not, St. Paul, Nebraska is full of people like that as well. People looking for a little bit of fulfillment, a little bit of purpose, a little bit of reason just to keep on going. And today, Joshua 23, it's, it's fitting, I guess, that God would have us be there today just with that weekend that I experienced as he, in this book, gives us just a little story of, of a people who are also looking for purpose, looking for fulfillment, for fulfillment. All of us, we're all looking for purpose. We want to make a difference. And the good news is that God has given us a purpose. Today, as we study this book of Joshua, or this chapter of Joshua, today we're going to learn how that purpose should be a continual motivation for all of us. Because those of us in our lives here, who've, those of us in this church who, who've experienced things like that, we recognize you wake up on Sunday morning and there was really no, not much fulfillment to be had, was there? There's not a lasting joy those type of things fade. So that crowd in Omaha on Saturday night was going to have a pretty tough Sunday. And that's something that we should not be pursuing. We should be pursuing something that when we wake up the next morning, we think, wow, God, that was awesome. Wow, God, that was good. That was fulfilling. That gave me a purpose. The children of Israel in a time in their life, when you sit there and look at them, they had a reality they were going through is they were living in a time when they had rest from their enemies. If you want to follow along, I put an insert in your, in your bulletin there. It's just a fill-in-the-blank insert, kind of help you track along with us a little bit. Makes the sermon go by a little bit faster for you if you want. But looking at the reality of Israel, they had rest from their enemies. And when you go to Joshua chapter 23, when you turn there and you follow along, you're going to read these verses where it says this. It says, a long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies. They had rest, a time when things weren't extremely stressful for them. But we know that when things aren't stressful, we get complacent, right? I had a good friend named Stewie Yoder, <laughs> strong Mennonite with the last name of Yoder, expect no less, right? Stewie Yoder, 
told me about a friend of his who came across an iron curtain. He brought his family out, of, out from behind the Iron Curtain, and they've lived in America for several years, and his friend was talking to Stewie. He said, you know what, Stewie? He said, there's part of me that wishes we never would have done this because my faith was stronger when I was behind the Iron Curtain than it is here in America. Well, why is that? Well, because in times of ease, we get complacent. In times of ease, we forget that we need to rely on God. In times of ease, it's easy to even forget God. So here we are, children of Israel, they had rest. And their leader recognized that. And so he wanted to challenge them one last time. You look at Joshua chapter two, 23, verse 2, he says this, Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and heads, its judges and officers, and said to them, well, what did he say to them? He said, look, guys, here's where we are. He said, look, this is what's going on. He said, look at me for just a moment. Look at who I am. I am your leader. Look at who I am. He said, I am old. I'm well advanced in years. I can't do this anymore. I'm your leader, but things are changing. There's a transition that's happening. Things are moving along here. I'm now old, and I'm well advanced in my years. So look at who I am, but, but forget that for just a moment. I'm just, I'm, I'm just a human being, essentially, I'm not God here. I'm getting older. I'm getting well advanced. I can't do what I used to do, but look at what God has done. He's reminding them of what God has done in the past for them, and it's just an amazing story of what God has done. As Joshua reminds him, he says, look, you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all of these nations for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. What an amazing reminder. It is the Lord your God who has fought for you. So look at what God has done. And then he goes on to say, but look at all that God has promised to do for you. God's promised to do a lot. And you have to remember what God has promised to do for all of you. Joshua goes on in verse 4. He says this. He says, look, behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes, those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I've already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. The Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight and you shall possess their land just as the Lord your God promised you. God's got some amazing things planned for you guys. Joshua reminding them, I'm just another person. I'm old. I'm well advanced. It's getting harder for me. I can't do this anymore. But God has been the one fighting for you anyway. And look at what God has promised to do. What a great reminder. And then he challenges, look, obey him. You need to obey him and receive the reward that he has promised for you. And he begins then in verse six. Therefore, be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left. Verse eight. But you shall cling to the Lord your God just as you have done to this day. Why? Whoops. Why? For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations. And as for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. Look at this. One man of you puts to fight a thousand, since it is Lord your God who fights for you just as he promised you. What an amazing thing. So says, look, you guys cling to God. God's going to continue to work through you in an amazing way. In an amazing way, God's going to do that. Now, I recognize that Joshua was talking to the nation of Israel, but my God's a consistent God. My God is the same as he was yesterday. Same today as it was yesterday. is going to be the same tomorrow as it was today. He's the same God. And so I believe in my heart that as, if we as a congregation continue to do this as well, as we continue to cling to God, God's going to continue to work through us in amazing ways. Let's look what Joshua has to say continuing on. He says, look, disobey him though and receive the punishment. He says this at the end of chapter 23. He says this is just an amazing thing. He says... Just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord your God has given you, if you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from off the good land that he has given you. And thus ends Joshua chapter 23. Joshua reminds him, look at, look at who I am. I'm just another, another person. I'm just an old guy. But God has been one fighting for you all along. God has promised to do many things for you. We need to obey him 
receive a reward, or if we choose to disobey him, we'll also receive something for that too. What a reminder for the people of Israel. And there's something for us in the middle of this as well. As we sit here and think about us as a church, there's a reality that we as a church need to face. We as a church, to a degree, are very similar to the nation of Israel. We've had a time when it seems like things are going well for us. We've had some moments where we can look and say, wow, God is really blessing. God's doing some great things. It's, to a degree, been almost easy for a little while. So for just a moment, we need to be challenged like the nation of Israel was challenged. I am not a Joshua, but we're going to try my best today, okay? Grace's reality is this, that we're still in the fight for St. Paul. We are still in the fight for St. Paul. The nation of Israel, they still had more to do. And Joshua challenged them and said, look, I've allotted a land for you, but there's more for you to go out and conquer. We have seen some growth here in our church, but there's a lot more for us to go out and conquer. Did you know that between 2000 and 2010 in Howard County, Nebraska, 18% churches dropped in attendance, 18%. 784 people quit attending church from 2000 to 2010 in Howard County, Nebraska. That's a lot of people. They weren't just going somewhere else, they were not attending anywhere. Those numbers are continuing to rise. Statistically speaking, 7% of Americans, and I was reading the statistic again this week, 7% of Americans believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven and that the Bible is true as it is written. Okay? So let's think about that for a moment. Do you have to believe the Bible is true as it is written to get to heaven? Well, the Bible says the only way to heaven is to believe in Jesus. It doesn't say you have to live a perfect life. It doesn't say you have to believe the Bible is true. It says you have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay, he's the Savior, the Son of God. That's what you have to believe. John 20, 31, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is Christ, Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name, okay? But if you don't believe that the Bible is true as it's written, what happens then? You're not going to stand too strong on that, even though you may believe it yourself. You're not going to push too hard for somebody else to believe that truth. And if somebody else says, well, there may be another way to heaven, and you don't have something to stand on, what are you? just foundering. Your purpose isn't real. 7%, 168 people in a town of 2,400 believe the Bible is true as it is written and that Jesus is the only way to heaven. 168 people. Guys, our fight in St. Paul is not done. We've barely even started. We have a long way to go. I recognize that our church by itself will not turn around national statistics, but our church in St. Paul can be an anomaly through the power of God working through us. I believe that. But we're in the fight. We're in the fight for it. And we need challenged, just like Israel need challenged. We need challenged as well. We need to understand that God has something for us. God has a purpose or something we can do that's fulfilling to us, that can bring us joy. That can make an eternal difference, not just a temporal difference. Look at this for just a moment. For just a moment, look at who I am. Guys, here's, re here's the reality. I am just another broken person, just like you. I am not extremely old or extremely advanced in my years. I'm getting there. I turned 40 in September. True story, people. Man. All right? Some of you guys, wow, you young kid. But you know what? Here's the reality. While I am not old, I am broken. I'm a human being just like you guys are. And the Bible speaks to that in Romans 3.23. It says, all of sin fall short of the glory of God. And of course, 1 John 1, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You look at that and say, you know what? My pastor's a sinner. And the answer is yes, he is. Look at my congregation and say, my congregation is full of sinners. And the answer to that is, yes, it is. We're all broken. But the great news, here's the great news, is I'm loved and I'm forgiven by God just like you are. 
And what an amazing thing that is to be loved and forgiven. What an amazing thing it is to have my slate wiped clean because of what Christ has done for us. Ephesians chapter 1, I like this part. In love, I love that. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself. As sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. You catch that? The redemption, the forgiveness, all because of his grace. We all have that. And so we're broken people, but we're loved, we're forgiven, we're redeemed. And it's an amazing thing to be there. What an amazing thing. And so, yeah, I'm just another person. I am not an awesome Joshua. But for a moment, as a pastor of this congregation, let's look at this. Let's, let's look at what God has done. What has God done? And you guys can see this. We have spiritual growth happening in our church. We have people who, who just this last week or last month, people came to say, Pastor, my marriage was changed because of things that happened at Grace. My life was changed because of the things that happened at Grace, because of what I learned at Grace. I'm a stronger Christian than I was a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. I'm a Christian because of grace. I'm going to heaven because of grace. Because grace introduced me to Jesus Christ. And I heard the message of the gospel. Guys, that's spiritual growth. That's God doing that. That's an amazing thing that God is doing through us. We can look at that and say, wow, God, that's awesome. We have new relationships because of what God is doing. New relationships, and we have new people in our church who also have new relationships. Our circle of influence has grown exponentially because of what God has done through grace. Let's be real, we got a new building. Joshua looked at the nation of Israel and said, look, look at all the land you guys have because of what God has done for you. The new place you have to live because of that. Joshua said, there's more for you to do. Yeah, we have a new building. We're not done yet either. We're getting ready to gut these walls out, to expand this sanctuary, to push it back some. Exciting times. All this because of God. Look at what God has done. And look what God has promised to do. This is a great thing. I love, I love what God's promised to do. You know, for us as individuals, if we can sit as individuals and rest in the promises of God, corporately, we can do amazing things. And I love what God's promised. He says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. There's a good work that's began in all of us. Pastor, you don't see me at home. Yeah, you're right, you don't. I don't. But you know what? It doesn't say it's finished yet. And it won't be finished until what? Until the day of Jesus Christ. All of us are going to be in a different path of our sanctification. Every single one of us. Now let's think about this for just a minute. A healthy church, in my estimation, not just mine, in estimations of people around the world, a healthy church is not a church that has, that every person in there is a mature, knowledgeable, Bible professor type person. That church is going to die. A healthy church is a church that has somebody who's not even a Christian coming in because they have questions and they feel comfortable. They've got people who, who may be a brand new believer warning about this whole thing. Some who are coming back to the Christian life after walking away for years and, and they still have questions but they're trying to grow. Others are just stumbling through this whole thing of life and God, how does this work? I'm trying to relate it to my life. Others are gonna be more mature but you're gonna have the whole gamut. You're gonna have people that are gonna struggle with their language. who are gonna struggle with drinking too much. You're gonna struggle with all these different things. Well, there's others who are gonna be past that to a large degree, and their temptation is gonna be something else. But we're gonna have the whole spectrum in a church. I've said before, and I repeat it again, I said, I don't want a church of the best people. I want a church of the most excited people. That's what God can use. So it doesn't matter where you are in that journey. Are you growing spiritually? Because God's began a work in you, and he is not done yet. So if you sit there and think, Pastor, I'm broken too. I'm messed up. Then I say, well, that's awesome. That just proves God's word is still true. That's awesome. And look at this. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. That part kept blameless. Am I going to be blameless before God? Honestly, the answer is no unless God looks at Christ and then looks at me. When he sees Christ's blood covering all of my sins, then he declares me blameless because of what Christ has done. And that's his promise. And man, what an amazing promise that is. It's just amazing. For I'm sure that neither death nor life 
nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There are days that we wonder, God, can you even love me with all that I've done? Paraphrase, there is nothing you can do to make God love you less than he does right now. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more than he does right now. God's love is unchanging, and there's nothing you can do to change that. Nothing. What an amazing promise by God. But we need to stay faithful to what God's called us to do. As a church, our challenge here, we need to stay faithful to what God has called us to do as a congregation. And what has God called us to do? Well, you guys said this even before I came. You talked about our purpose. You guys said our purpose of grace, and our purpose is this. is the purpose of grace church to what? Make mature followers of Jesus Christ. We should know this. We talk about it all the time. We are here to make mature followers of Jesus Christ. That is our purpose. Nothing else. We're not here to grow a church even though it's our vision. We're not here to grow a church of 240 people in five years. That's not our purpose. Our purpose is to make mature followers of Jesus Christ. And as we do that, then we let God do the rest. And can he bring 240? Yes, he can. Have I failed if he doesn't? As long as there's spiritual growth. No, I haven't. If our church stays the exact same size for the next 10 years, but there are people growing spiritually, we are doing what God called us to do. The question is, are people growing? Are people growing? What's that look like? Three things it looks like. Our threefold mission is to do this. We are first to introduce people to Christ. That's the first thing we do, introduce people to Christ. We train them to live in Christ, and then what? We send them to serve Christ. Now, don't get panicked on us here. It's not that we're going to ask you to go to another town. <coughs> we're not. But think about this. First time Awana leaders, did you feel sent to go talk to those kids? Probably. To a degree, it may have even been terrifying. Say, so, I don't know if I can handle this, Pastor. Sunday school teachers, do you feel sent to that classroom of kids? Nursery workers, all of our new committee members this year that we've elected brand new, and you're wondering, man, God, am I ready to do this? That's you being sent. People who are doing ministry for God are being sent, and all of us have a ministry. We introduce them, we train them, we send them. That is how we make mature followers of Jesus Christ. And I don't know where you are in that spectrum, but all of you in that spectrum should also be trying to bring somebody up as well. Introducing somebody, training somebody, and then sending, and maybe even going alongside them into a new ministry. That's the purpose of grace. To this year's church leaders, there's a challenge. The tasks are not more important than the reasons for the task. I mentioned this on Monday night, and you may ask, Pastor, what does that mean? The tasks are not more important than the reasons for the task. Again, this last weekend was in Omaha. We like to, I love a good will shop. My bride loves it even more than I do. There's some great deals you find. We had a lot of thrift stores. We had a lot of thrift stores. Anyway, in one good will, down off of 84th Street, they had a sign. Behind, their, behind the cashier's desk for the cashiers to read. It said this, customers are not an interruption to your job. They are the reason you have a job. For all of us in leadership of this church, whether it's a Sunday school teacher, a WANA leader, trustee, deaconess, deacon, operations committee, worship team, whatever you are, the task that you're doing is not more important than the reason you're doing it. And the people are the reason we're doing it. We should be praying for people at Grace. We should be talking to people at Grace. We should be encouraging people at Grace. We should be taking those times when God throws you, throws you at somebody or whatever, you're seeing somebody on the sidewalk or whatever it is, hey, what's going on today? We're here because of the people. So in leadership, remember, you're here because of the people. And then the Bible talks about this, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Look not only to his own, but also to the interests of others. And then in Romans chapter 12, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you to not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Guys, we are not more important than anyone else. And we're here because of someone else. We're here because of Jesus Christ. And he's asked us to serve as he has served. This is our opportunity. Are we going to obey God 
and reap the blessings he has for us? Or are we gonna choose to walk away from that, to disobey God, and die like so many other churches are in America today? Then to all of us, we must keep the main thing, the main thing. And what is the main thing? Well, let's think about this for just a minute. I've already mentioned it. Our vision for five years, for 10 years, that's not the main thing. The main thing is our purpose, to make mature followers of Jesus Christ. Look at this. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed in judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And what's a commandment that God has given us? One we're going to look at here is this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Go and make disciples paraphrase, go and make mature followers of Jesus Christ. That is the main thing. I've been reading a guy by the name of John Dickerson. John Dickerson was, is a pastor who's also a statistician, reading a lot of surveys. He's the one that I read that statistic, 7% of America today is evangelical, meaning they believe Jesus is the only way to heaven, the Bible is true as it's written. In that book, he wrote this, he said, by Christ's own words, this is the simplest gauge we use to measure success or failure. Are we making disciples? Guys, if our church shrinks in the next five years, that we've had people coming out who are more mature than when they came in, did we make disciples? Yes, we did. Did we fulfill the Great Commission? Yes, we did. That is the main thing. As individuals, we all have a part in this. As a congregation, we do. The worship team's gonna come up and they're gonna close us in a song. During that song, Kalina's gonna announce a time when she wants the leadership, the new committee members to come up. We're gonna pray a prayer of blessing on them. A prayer of blessing to help them hopefully remember to keep the main thing the main thing. And then we as a congregation, reminder for us that we need to keep the main thing, the main thing. I'm gonna pray and worship is gonna come up. God, help us to gauge our success the same way you gauge our success. We are a small country church and God, I don't know whether you intend for us to get larger, whether you intend for us to stay the same or whether you intend for us to get smaller. God, I don't know. But I do know that you intend for us to make disciples. And may we all do that. And whatever area we serve, may that be our passion. May that be what brings us fulfillment because Lord, I know it will. When we can help make a difference in somebody's life through your power, that's the most fulfilling thing we'll ever experience. <coughs> help us as a church, help us as individuals to never forget that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.